Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Felix Lutsch, and I'm here today with Brian Crane. Today, we're speaking with Jose Macedo, who is head of Delphi Labs. Delphi Labs is part of Delphi Digital, a pioneering crypto company that has three divisions, research, ventures, and labs. The main focus of Delphi Labs at this point is Mars Protocol, a new DeFi-focused hub built leveraging the Cosmos stack. Welcome, Jose, to Epicenter. Thanks very much for having me. Big fan of the show and of and of you guys as well. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, so glad to to have you on after uh, so many years of being like in a similar space. So um, as is customary on on Epicenter, I guess the first question we ask generally is sort of you know how did you end up in crypto? So I think for you this is a is a quite interesting story. So excited to hear a bit about it. Yeah, it's a long it's a it's a long story. I I started off playing uh, in, my, in my teens, kind of playing professional poker, which was uh, the, the way that I first got into like economics and, and, and game theory and stuff like that. Um, then I, I went to, to university, studied politics, philosophy and, and economics there. Started a couple of businesses, including uh, like very random businesses, like a cleaning company, a, a martial arts academy, all sorts of different, different stuff. And then actually someone came, like a friend of a friend, came to train at my uh, martial arts academy. And this person uh, who, who's still in crypto, but I think doesn't like to be doxxed, has quite a big kill count as well in terms of getting people into crypto. But uh, they, they kind of talked to me about, about Ethereum. Um, and it just made sense to me pretty much instantly. Like no one, uh, I'd heard about Bitcoin a bunch of times before. Uh, people had even offered to settle kind of transactions back in the poker days and Bitcoin and stuff, but I just never bothered to, to look into it. And also it wouldn't have clicked for me, I think. The, the kind of just pure non-sovereign money thing, but the world computer thesis really, really did click for me. Um, and so pretty much uh, like a week later, I had put everything on hold, like all the businesses and everything, and was just kind of diving down the rabbit hole, reading everything I could on on crypto and on like monetary history and, and all sorts of stuff like that. And then, yeah, started working in the space pretty soon after just because I wanted to find more smart people to, to kind of learn alongside. Um, Started off as a as an analyst at a at a company called like Amazix back in the days. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you guys remember that. It was like a community management company from 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 the ICO days. I was just like speaking to a bunch of founders, assessing a bunch of projects. We worked with like Bancor and a bunch of other kind of cool projects. Um, and I was writing research on, on my blog in my spare time and kind of connected through that with with Delphi. I'd written a post on Ethereum back when Ethereum just was, was just kept going down. Um, and people were saying that that uh, that Ethereum would never capture value, that it was going to zero. There was the famous Tetris Capital blog, if you remember that, where they were like short Ethereum. Uh, and I just wrote a piece just basically saying why I was bullish Ethereum and, and value capture. It actually talked about EIP 1559, uh, which was already being discussed in the Ethereum forums back then. And um, yeah, Delphi cited me in one of their research reports. And then I went on their podcast. We started collaborating and and kind of... Yeah, the rest is history. Started Delphi Ventures, co-founded that, and then co-founded Delphi Labs. Yeah, so Delphi is sort of like an interesting and you know unusual type of organization. I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about, you know, how did Delphi get started, and like you know what did it look like when you joined? So when I joined, Delphi was a pure research company. So, and that, that's kind of how it started. So most of the, so the, the, the kind of co-founders on the research side come from traditional finance, actually from, from equity research at, at Bloomberg and, and Deutsche Bank. And in, in 2018, they fell down the crypto rabbit hole and thought, you know, if we can get paid to just like learn about crypto and, and write about crypto, that's like the dream job. So uh, they started that and just started writing like really good research, right? I mean, I remember at the time when I started uh, in crypto, um, I started in 2017, but by, by the time I was really looking into this stuff, Delphi was writing by far the best research in the space. And what I was doing was mainly consulting at uh, Amazing. So I I'd, I'd started off analyzing projects and then I kind of figured out that the main problem that every project had was just like token economics. Like the, the a lot of times the project was cool, but the token just didn't make any sense. It was just like a medium of exchange, right? Like in, in order to use this network, you need to use our token. And that was like never going to capture value. And so... Uh, I had kind of built in a niche just focused on designing good good token models and and that was going really well and basically uh, i came to delphi to help with research but also lead the consulting side at the time so uh 
Delphi at the time was mainly focused purely on research. And then when I joined, we, we started labs and started focusing on consulting where we did like token design, mechanism design, eventually smart contract work as well for projects like Aave and Thorchain and, and Balancer and, and, and stuff like that. And pretty much at the same time, we started the Delphi Ventures, which is which was our fund. So that was a long story, but we, we basically spent all of 2019 trying to raise money. Um, we had this anchor investor that was like, started off in for 20, then for 10, then for five, then like didn't, didn't end up investing anything and had a bunch of other uh, funny fundraising stories from 2019. I mean, I think we were, we're pretty bad at fundraising, but it was also really hard in, in 2019 with the bear market and stuff. Everyone thought crypto was dead, had a bunch of meetings like all around Europe and the world with people that was you know, super frustrating. Like I remember having one dinner with one guy and, and uh, at the end of the dinner, he, he was like, oh yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm in, but can I pay cash? And I was like, no, <laughs> we can't, we can't loan to your money, sir. I'm really sorry. Um, so yeah, it was really frustrating, but in the end we didn't get any external investors for, for, for ventures. And so we, we ended up putting in just our own money. So we'd found synthetics was, was a project we were really bullish on and we, we worked with them on their risk framework and stuff. And so we made a bit of money there. And then we found Thorchain, which we wanted to be the first investment for the fund because we thought it was just synthetics, but for a use case that had like more product market fit, you know, like it was clear that people wanted to trade Bitcoin on chain, whereas synthetics, like it wasn't as clear people wanted to trade synthetic assets. So we wanted to, to invest in it, make it the first investment of the fund. And we, we made a, an OTC deal with the team. And then at the time that it was going to close, uh, our investor pulled out and we just like put in our own money, basically levered up like credit card debt and everything. And yeah, started with, with about a million dollars of our own capital, uh, the seven of us t together and kind of uh, grew it from there. Yeah, that's really cool. And I think, you know, obviously today we're also here a lot to talk about labs, which you're the head of, and, and you sort of mentioned it was created in parallel sort of for the consulting first, but then you also, you know, started basically incubating or building your own projects. Can you talk a little bit about how, how that came about? For sure. And so, yeah, people get confused about Delphi. So we're all equal partners in kind of the three businesses roughly. And then we, we, we all focus on different parts. So there's the research, the ventures, and the, and the labs, and different. Uh, so us seven, uh, we, we all focus on kind of different parts of the business. So yeah, uh, labs started off focused on consulting. So yeah, did, did some work with, with Ave and Thorchain and stuff. And at some point, we realized that we'd gained a lot of IP and, and built a really good team doing consulting. And consulting tends to get like a bit frustrating after a while, right? Because people don't always take your ideas on. Um, and, and you just you just feel like you want to be in there building rather than like kind of consulting on on on, on how to build. Um, and also it's just like sales cycles and, and Gantt charts and stuff. Like at a certain point you kind of get bored of, of doing all that stuff. And so yeah, we, we started um, kind of incubating our project projects from from scratch. And at the time we, we identified kind of Solana and Terra as the two ecosystems we were most bullish on. Um, started build, building on 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 both of those but quickly kind of realized Solana was way uh, earlier and more difficult to build on than, than Terra. This was like in early 2021, like even getting your transactions included in a block in Solana back then was difficult. And there was a bunch of like closed source libraries and stuff that made it, that made it challenging. So we ended up making the kind of fateful decision to focus most of our building efforts on, on Terra. And that started off uh, really well. We launched kind of uh, Astroport first and then, and then Mars on Terra. Yeah, it was they were they were pretty successful while 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 Terra was successful. Astroport had about you know one one to two billion in TVL. It was a top five decentralized exchange by volume within like a month of launch. Yeah, and and had a pretty exciting roadmap planned. And then Mars also had about nearly a billion in in, in TVL and and um was yeah it was just getting kind of getting getting started when 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 Terra collapsed. Since then, we've been kind of obviously working with those projects to. To help them find a new home, uh, did a bunch of research on that. Ended up choosing Cosmos as, as the new home, and and you know wrote a big research report on that. And yeah, Astroport is now live on on a bunch of different chains on Cosmos. Mars is is its own chain, and then has its first outpost on on Osmosis. And yeah, I guess the evolution was started off with with consulting. Then we went to kind of building our own and incubating our, our own our own projects. And the idea of that was always that uh, Mars and Astroport would be kind of an example of of showing people what we can do and and like how uh, how successful we can be and the value we can add to projects and then we would use that as an example to kind of attract other smart builders to come to come and build with us and scale it out from there but 
um, Mars and Astroport kind of became so successful at a certain point that they that it didn't make sense for us to do anything else. Um, and and now we're we're uh, and also like they required a lot of our, our attention. But now those projects are are pretty much independent, and so um, we we were focused back on the on the accelerator and on kind of attracting new builders to work on like all the other ideas that that we think are are exciting as well. Cool. Yeah, I definitely want to talk more about the accelerator later. So with regards to Terra, right? So you guys were focusing on the Terra ecosystem. What what are your biggest learnings from that episode? We we went into Terra with with our eyes like wide open, to be honest. So like we had been involved in ESD before, and and like we'd always been kind of fascinated by decentralized stablecoins. I think Maker was the first project we ever covered on the on the research side as well. So we kind of understood the risks, and we we always pointed out the risks, and and like wrote wrote threads about the risks and stuff. So it's hard to say that 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 what happened was uh, like people call it a black swan. It definitely wasn't a black swan, right? It was it was it was a known risk. Um, but I think probably one one thing I learned in general from 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 2022 was just that like building wrote like in crypto, um, everything that can break will break. And so I think building robustness into your systems and building for the long term is more important than kind of like short term success. Um, and I think you saw a lot of examples of of like stuff breaking in, in in 2022 that looked like it was super successful, right? Whether it's whether it's Terra or FTX, even like I remember FTX at a certain point uh, had like uh, even I think well into sort of 2021 they had like 100 something employees, and I was like, that's not that much bigger than Labs, and and look what they've built. Like, damn, this these guys are like super smart. Uh, you know, we're we we need to we need to catch up. We need to work harder. And then you realize that they were like holding private keys on a Google Docs, right? And, and doing all sorts of crazy stuff, like taking all sorts of shortcuts. Um, and I think 2022 ended up revealing a lot of that, that a lot of the projects that you thought were successful were taking uh, shortcuts that, that you couldn't see, but that became obvious as soon as there was like market stressor. Um, and, and I think a lot of the times uh, the projects where that happens is where the flaws are sort of covered up by charismatic leaders of, of some sort, right? Um, where you know humans were naturally attracted to kind of like charismatic leaders you want to you, you, you want to follow and I think the projects where that ended up being the biggest problem was was when where there was that where people kind of looked past the flaws of the project because they had this this charismatic leader so I think one big lesson that it reinforced was kind of the yeah don't trust verify um, and just be more annoyed like kind of our, our GC Gabe Shapiro says like be more suspicious of uh, of, of, of what's going on and uh, I think that was probably one of my biggest learnings from 2022, and it also affected how we like build, how we incubate, how we think about the space. We've always been pretty long-term oriented, and actually, like Terra was a was a long-term bet when we made it. Like Terra, when when we started building on it, was nowhere near what it what it ended up as. Like UST supply was under a bill, um, well under a bill, and, and and so like, and we we felt that if that wouldn't take off until there was some pressure on on centralized stablecoins, which would which would take a while, and so we just wanted to kind of build towards that. Definitely didn't expect the, the 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 success it had, and think like in hindsight, it's pretty apparent that like anchor was was a mistake. Keeping yield that high was, was a mistake. Um, yeah, and it was frustrating because I think it ended up being the mistake that every other algorithmic stablecoin made, which is just to grow supply too too quickly um, compared to like the the base of real demand that that there, that there actually is. So um, yeah, I'd say that was the that was the biggest lesson. And did you like? I guess building Mars uh, back then and now building like its own cost, your own cosmos chain with it. Did you apply like these learnings? You, would you say like in practice in, in some sense, like could you give an example maybe of how you. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, yeah. First of all, we, we always focus on like five years from now or like 10 years from now when we're thinking about making these decisions, like um, in terms of product, in terms of protocol, like, like, And, and so one example could be when we were looking around for, for where to build, like layer twos looked really exciting. Um, but re realistically, like layer twos are still extremely centralized, right? You're, you're relying on like a centralized sequencer. Uh, most of them don't even have like fraud proofs in, in production. Obviously, CK is, is very far away. And so for us, that was like something that we didn't want to deal with. Like we, we, we didn't want to deal with those centralization risks and those like potential technical, technical issues. 
Uh, the same thing with kind of Aptos and, and Sui. It was like they were exciting ecosystems, but uh, still very early for us. And like Cosmos for us, like the the, the kind of uh, Cosmos SDK stack was super battle tested, right? Even Terra itself, the collapse of Terra was like kind of a, a notch on 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 that stacks. You know, um, yeah, like it it, it made it, it it's really robust. So that was like one of the one of the big reasons why we decided to to stay on Cosmos, and also why we decided to kind of uh, or the project decided to launch launch our own chain because it's just like the way that gives you the most control and flexibility over 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 what you're doing. And so yeah, that I think that was a big thing. Um, also, like why I decided to kind of launch on Osmosis because we, we thought that team was very long term oriented. Thought it was a like a, again very battle tested stack. So. Um, that was an example of 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 kind of that that coming into play, but I think in general you can kind of see it in, in a bunch of like small decisions that you have to make day to day about how to do things, uh, whether to take shortcuts or not. You know, like if you want to list even listing something like ST Atom, right? You see a lot of other money markets list that uh, and just use the Atom Oracle price, you know, and that's that's in like most of the time that might be fine, but there's some percentage of the time where where it uh, depegs and the protocol actually ends up with bad debt. And, and sort of Mars will never will never use take take shortcuts like that, right? It's always going to be be trying to do it the right way, even if it takes longer, even if it means it's not as comp- not a competitive not as competitive a product in the short term. Yeah, and there's as I said, there's like loads of I think when you're that the an exercise that we did actually at, at Labs and which was really cool was just doing the values thing. Like I always thought that was just like corporate, um, you know, like a very corporate thing, you know, because because most values are just like sound bites, right? Like honesty or, or, or like integrity or whatever. And I think the way to do those values right is to have uh, values that actually have like meaningful opposites, right? Where there could be, where like, let's say you, you choose, for example, um, long-term oriented, you, some, some companies value like Facebook is, is like uh, ship fast and break things, right? Which, which is like in a sense, the, the, the opposite of, of long-term oriented. Like long-term oriented might mean you actually ship slower and, and you don't move as fast. And so I think like having those setting up those values is really important. And for us, we're definitely more on the slower, uh, more careful side, especially after what happened in in 2022. It just kind of reinforced that. And it also means like certain projects that are out there right now. Uh, I, I don't really want to mention them th- them by name, but like certain projects that are out there right now that are, that are like growing really fast. They definitely have like problems with their with their tech stack, whether it's like multi sigs holding you know billions and billions of dollars or um, just like unstable chains or like with the, the, that have like deep uh, reorgs or whatever. Um, I think those, those things are things that we're much more careful with uh, right, right now when, when we think about launching somewhere. So let, let's talk a little bit about Mars so on a high level. Like what is the vision for Mars and how has the vision changed since the time you were building on Terra versus like where it is today? The best way to describe kind of the, the vision for Mars in my mind, and obviously different people have, it's a decentralized project, so different people have, have different visions for it and different th- beliefs on, on where it should go. But for me, it's like a, like an FTX-like experience for DeFi. And like that sounds even, uh, like that was the vision before FTX collapsed. And I think now it makes even, even more sense why you'd want that, right? Why you actually want it decentralized and not centralized. Um, and the idea with that is just having this, this sub-account where uh, you're able to to have like all your DeFi positions, your your yield farming, your LPing, your staking, your trading, uh, all in one single account with a single kind of like margin threshold. Um, and so the 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 way I think about it is kind of like building a sub account for for DeFi, where you can do all your on-chain activity from this one account and perform like leveraged interactions with with every single protocol from from one account. And and for me that was the real. That was the reason that I that I liked uh, that and that I used FTX over over other exchanges, right? When you use something like Binance, um, it's like you you have like your spot account and then your isolated margin account and your cross margin account and your futures account and like everything is separated out. You have to transfer from account to account, and it, it's like everything was built by different teams. They don't really talk to each other, and it's just not a great user experience. You can end up getting liquidated on your futures account even though you have a bunch on your on your on your spot account, right? And it's just not as capital efficient. So, and, and I think that's ultimately um, the name of the game in, in, in DeFi and finance is like capital efficiency, right? You want your your capital to sit somewhere where you can do the most things with it. Um, and I think if you build that, 
there's a bunch of st stuff that can that can come off it because um, for, for example I think stable coins actually is, is also a capital efficiency problem and something that can be that can be built on top of, of, of a system like this because um, like I think uh, algorithmic designs are kind of like dead or at least I won't be uh, you know fucking around and finding out with with uh, algorithmic uh, designs anymore and so I think what you have left is just like debt based designs and the issue with debt based designs is like a capital problem right it's really hard to bootstrap uh, enough enough capital to actually to actually make a stable coin uh, that's large enough to satisfy like the demand for for, for a stable coin and so um, what you end up seeing is they have to take on centralized collateral and they just don't grow that fast right and so all the successful stable coins end up being built around centralized exchanges because they have the most capital right like USDC was built around coinbase tether was built around bitfinex back in the day and BUSD was built around binance and those are the three biggest centralized stable coins by, by market cap and so my kind of hypothesis is that the winning decentralized stable coin will be built around the winning decentralized exchange uh, because it's just a, a debt product it's like another debt you can issue against your account and so I think whoever ends up building that decentralized FTX um, will end up having uh, like being in a good position to build decentralized stable coins and, and a bunch of other kind of uh, like important things right and because because back in the beginning, uh, you know, you were building on Terra, right? So it was basically like an application on the Terra chain, whereas now it's sort of like its own chain. But like, you know, this outpost concept, which uh, I think maybe we can get into. Is that, is that um, how, what, what, does, what changes that? Did you did you also when it was on Terra, for example, did you also imagine that you would like I don't know try to integrate lots of assets from other chains via some sort of bridges or like how how did you imagine that back then? Yeah, I think with Mars actually the the plan was always to eventually be its own chain. We kind of saw that as a as a as an interesting model, um, and and like we didn't. So like obviously there's there's two ways to yeah. Well, so yeah, when it started off, it was an application on, on Terra. I think we always saw the appeal of being 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 its own chain, but um, it was more so so that it could be anywhere because Mars is a is a, is a credit protocol, right? And so sure. ideally, it should be available anywhere that there can be demand for credit. And at the time, the most demand for credit was on was on Terra. Terra had the most growth, the most like um, stable coins as well, and so it had the most demand for credit. But we, we definitely saw, like, we, we were never Terra Maxis, right? We, we, we knew that there would be other ecosystems that succeeded. And so we wanted, a, a, like, a, a chance to, to, to be on there. And this sort of hub and outpost design, which actually Sonny um, was, was one, of the, one of the original people who, who kind of described this to us, made a lot of sense um, to us. Uh, because with, with credit, it makes, like, uh, there's kind of two options when you, when you build these app chains, right? The one is you put, like, uh, all the assets on the on the app chain basically and make everyone move their move their assets over uh, or you keep all the assets on the on the edge right on, on these on these outposts and like the first model is kind of like thor chain right and the second model is more like sushi where it has outposts on a, on a bunch of different chains and for us for for a credit protocol the latter always made more more sense because if you want to build um a decentralized ftx like experience and, and build that winning decentralized exchange you, you kind of need synchronicity and, and atomicity, right? You need things to happen fast and, and ideally to be on the same execution environment so that you can do things like liquidations, right? Where you need to, a contract needs to observe another contract state and then call a, you know, call a liquidation function, this kind of thing. We wanted that to happen synchronously and also just like trading itself, it needs, needs to be fast. Like already five second blocks aren't that fast. And so like if you have to wait for, for IBC relayers and stuff, it's just not really, really feasible. And, and so, yeah, the, the vision, the cool thing about the hub and outpost model is it means Mars can expand like anywhere, anywhere that, they, that, that the hub can send messages to, which uh, right now is, is a lot of places. There's a like with IBC, obviously, it's Cosmos chains, although there are people working on bridges to Ethereum and stuff as well. Um, but you can use other bridges to send messages anywhere. Uh, Mars could have an outpost anywhere. Right. Um, and then it becomes similar to like a traditional uh, like the metaphor we, we use sometimes is like the. A, tr a traditional business or bank, right? Where you have the headquarters of the bank, but then they have bank branches all around the country and sometimes also in, in, in different countries, right? 
And that's kind of how we see uh, Mars, where you have the, the, the hub, which is like the headquarters, which does the accounting, the staking, um, the and, and governance. And then you have all these different outposts that serve uh, different chains and different different markets, as it were, with, with, with credit. Um, yeah. So you, you know, you mentioned this vision, right, of this FTX, decentralized FTX-like product. And then you mentioned, and I think it is also, you know, like spot trading, like lending, margin, derivatives, and yield. It's a lot of different stuff. Do you imagine that Mars would build all of those? And where are you focusing right now? Or would it be sort of that, like, Mars will leverage those in different places and, I don't know, have some sort of, yeah, can you, can you explain a little bit, like, yeah, to what extent this is all, like, built within Mars versus, you know, kind of assembling different pieces together? For sure. And so this was always the, the so I think the answer is when I assemble different pieces together, when I integrate with, with stuff that already exists rather than build everything. Um, and that was always the vision for Mars, right? And on Terra, there, it had this primitive called smart contract credit lines, which kind of leveraged yield farming is an, is an, is an example of that, which is just like, um, you know, if you think about Aave or, or Compound, um, you can only borrow less than, than what you put in, right? Because uh, you could do anything with, with, with the capital. So I can never give you more than what you have as collateral because you could just run away with it, right? And there would be no incentive for you to ever pay back. Um, with, with Mars, uh, the idea is that uh, Mars can lend to smart contracts that are performing a certain action. So for example, margin trading or leveraged yield farming, right? And then the smart, so, so in, in the case of margin trading, for instance, let's say you wanna go long Atom, Mars could, could lend you uh, stable coins and then buy the Atom and hold the, the Atom as collateral and then uh, effectively liquidate you if Atom drops below a certain, um, like threshold that's specified in the smart contract. And so that's much more similar to what a centralized exchange does, right? Where centralized exchange can give you 100x leverage on something because they hold the, the collateral and what they loan you and they can liquidate you, right? Whereas uh, for a normal money market, it's difficult to do that. So the idea with Mars is just to extend that concept to any kind of uh, smart contract or, or uh, borrowing activity. Leverage staking, uh, leverage LPing, even NFTs, like if they have enough liquidity, uh, could also be included into this. Basically, anything that you can do on chain where it can be like the activity can be encoded into a smart contract and the collateral in the smart contract has enough liquidity that Mars can reason about how to liquidate it. If, if, the, if the activity goes wrong, uh, Mars can extend credit for it. And so it's like a, a very cool concept because eventually as more and more things get tokenized, you could extend it to like real world things, right? Like a mortgage is effectively just a, like a smart contract credit line, right? As long as the house could be, could be tokenized and, and, and put into a smart contract, then that can be included into this. And so the, the idea with it is, is not that um, Mars would go and like build mortgages and build spot trading and, and margin trading and everything like that, but that it would uh, integrate with, with existing primitives and act as a sub account built on top of all these different DeFi primitives. Now there's like sort of a, an, an edge case there, which is with designs that have their own leverage built in, um, because there it's, it's, it's slightly different. So for example, like a CDP, like a, a maker like CDP, if, if Mars were to integrate with something like that, then um, the, the whole point of, of Mars is that you have this credit account with one liquidation threshold, right? But if you integrate with something like a CDP, there's actually two liquidation thresholds. There's the, the CDP liquidation threshold and then, and then Mars is like credit account liquidation threshold. And so there, there's sort of two different approaches on, on how to do it. The, the first one is just to do like a DeFi saver like thing of rebalancing, right? So um, if your CDP is, is, uh, is about to get liquidated, but you have extra like borrowing capacity on your credit account, it would just borrow from your credit account and add collateral to the CDP, for, for example, or pay down some of the debt of the CDP and, and vice versa. Uh, or Mars can build those itself and kind of integrate them into the credit account, account uh, itself. Um, and I think like one interesting case where that comes along is perps, where uh, I think like there's no, no perps currently live on, on, on Cosmos. And so uh, some Mars contributors are, are, are considering kind of building that out as, as, as part of Mars so that, so that that can be offered as, as part of this. Yeah, maybe 
we can take it back a bit and you can sort of, I guess we talked a lot about Mars already, but maybe it helps to sort of break it down into like the components that Mars has for the listeners. Yeah, for sure. So um, I guess the best way to think about it is Mars has lenders on, on one side, right? Which uh, are lending like similar to how you would lend on Aave or Compound or, or a traditional money market. Um, and then on the other side, you have borrowers, which on Aave and, and Compound, it's people that like borrowers are always lenders as well, right? You, you have to deposit capital into the, into the protocol in order to lend because you need to have collateral. On, on Mars, uh, you have non-lender uh, borrowers, right? Which are people who are, who are actually just like trading or they're leveraged LPing or they're doing something like that. And they're not actually lenders, they're, they're just borrowers, right? But they want to, um, for example, use some USDC to go long on Atom or they, or they want to use some Atom to, to short Atom, right? Um, so I think that's the big, the big difference that in, on, on Mars, you have this other class of borrower, which doesn't need to have collateral on the, on, on the platform, but actually just wants to do some activity with the capital that's, that's, that's being lent out on the, on the platform. And then in the middle of that, you have, um, well, middle is probably not the, the, the best way to say it, but you have like governance, which decides on, uh, the risk parameters for, for, for this different lending activity and uh, effectively like it's stakers who have skin in the game and decide how the protocol should work, what kind of use cases it should lend to and what the risk parameters for those, for those use cases should be. Yeah. So basically for each like sort of collateral type, you're setting some sort of ratios and this is done via governance votes on Mars or is there like some algorithmic component or is it like purely governance? Yeah, so so Mars right now is is um it's like the the V one is is more like a, a traditional um, money market. So yeah, each each collateral type would have a would have a governance vote regarding risk parameters and asset listings go through a governance vote. Um, with with uh, V two that'll be kind of where the credit account functionality goes live, and then like every specific. Uh, integration would, would have a, a, a governance vote. So for example, if someone wants to go margin long um, Atom, that would be a, a specific integration where Mars would integrate with uh, the AMM on that chain, whether it's Osmosis and in the case of Osmosis or, or if it's elsewhere, some other AMM um, and, and basically uh, like integrate that margin trading functionality and set, a, and set risk parameters for, for that as well, like liquidation levels, max leverage, this kind of, this kind of thing. And like, for example, the, the rates at which people can borrow and lend, is that sort of a little bit like in compound or RA that, you know, it depends on kind of, you know, the supply and demand and is it's updated continuously based on that? Yep. It's very similar to, to that. It's like a, a curve, right? Like a kink curve that uh, tries yeah. to target some optimal utilization and, uh, and rates go up. It, you know, kinks at the optimal utilization and then rates go up very aggressively to, to punish kind of illiquidity. Um, we did play around with like a dynamic interest rate model using a uh, control theory, but it was just like too many variables uh, to launch with to start. But I still think that's, that's interesting. And yeah, there are other things that are interesting there too, but I think for now it's, it, we're using, like Mars is using the kind of algorithmic formula. So you talked a little bit about sort of the components in terms of, you know, borrowers, lenders, um, what about if you look at it in terms of technical architecture, you know, what are the components of Mars protocol, um, you know, the technical components of Mars protocol? I think like Larry or, or someone would be best positioned to, to, to speak about this, but there's basically Mars hub, which is the, the chain level, um, where, where governance happens, staking happens, um, and, and fees get, get, get sent there as well. Um, then you have the, the red bank, which is kind of like the, the Aave or compound like module where you can do lending and, and borrowing and the interest rate, uh, formula is, 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 uh, enforced and all of that. And then you have like the, the credit account, which will be its, its own module, which is called the credit manager, um, which effectively like manages all the different integrations that of, of different borrowings that can be done with red bank assets. Um, yeah. 
I'm, I'm sure like someone like Larry could probably go into more depth, but that's that's uh, the yeah my understanding. Yeah, makes sense. I think maybe also like interesting to hear. So sort of this Mars, I guess, one of the first to have this like hub and spoke model with with the that you have. Do you think this is like going to be the standard design for um, interchain applications? I think so. I think in, in a way it already is the the, the standard model. Like um, something like Aave uh, or Uniswap effectively has a model like this, right? Where the the hub sits on Ethereum, but then they have outposts on like Polygon and Avalanche and stuff like that. And uh, it, it's already actually governed from from Ethereum. I actually don't know uh, how how that's done. Um, I think there's some form of of, of like cross chain messaging that, that that's used there. But that I think that already is like the model for a lot of how how DeFi works. Um, there are there are advantages to to doing it the 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 Cosmos way to having having your own chain instead, and in terms of what you can do with that. But yeah, I, I do think this is going to be like um, a pretty standard model for how for how cross chain applications are are deployed. So the advantages being sort of that you have this shared liquidity across the different outposts, which I guess on Uniswap you don't really have since you have like a new pool and you're not really able to share the liquidity there. Only like the governance decisions can sort of be transported, I guess, to to the other chain. Yeah, you could do that. I mean, like, um, yeah, with, with Uniswap, there is no concept of shared liquidity and, and not with Aave either. But like arbitragers effectively can can do that functionality, right? Uh, both on, on Uniswap and on Aave, you can... You, you can kind of arb arb the rates. Um, I think with with Mars, uh, the team started off with this concept of a of a rebalancer at the at the chain level, which would effectively like move assets around the different outposts to try and equalize the the utilization rates, right? Which just means that if there's a lot of borrowing demand in in one place and not so much in the other, then it would move in. Like, let's say there's a lot of borrowing demand on chain A, but not so much on chain B. It would move assets from chain B to chain A to try and like satisfy that that demand, right? Um, I think now uh, the team's kind of moved away from 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 that design for for a few reasons. Uh, one of them being that there might be a reason why the the, the rates are lower on, on a certain chain uh, and, and higher on another one. Like people might perceive it to be more risky, for example, um, and it's and it's useful to have that like market signal. And it could also lead to situations where like let's say a chain is being hacked. You're just consistently putting more capital into the chain that, that's being hacked, right? And so instead, how I think the Mars team is thinking of implementing that is just as a vault strategy, where as a depositor, you can choose to deposit on one outpost, or you can choose to deposit into this vault that rebalances your deposit around different outposts to maximize the, the rate, right? Uh, and that way, it's a, it's a decision on the lender side rather than being a, a, a protocol enforced thing. So what, one of the... Especially, I think mean, back in today, this is a while ago, a very common criticism that you know the Ethereum people would have against something like Cosmos was that hey, uh, you know, you really want to have this sort of like synchronicity, and you know, you can make like one transaction and it calls like you know different smart contracts at the same time, and this is like very powerful. And the example we often used was like this flash loan thing, right? Where like within one transaction, you could like borrow some money, do something, make a profit, pay back the money. So you could, you could basically like get capital for free without having to put up any collateral. And, you know, this was kind of the prime example. Now, of course, Cosmos doesn't work like that with IBC. I think at the same time, you said that the outposts, can have this sort of like you know instant functionality right and but can you can you talk a little bit about you know how do the output how does this work and you know where does the asynchronous nature of like ibc and you know uh, interoperability still come in and you know do, do any kind of like issues arise from this kind of design yeah it's a good uh it's a good point so I think um, if you look at the state on different smart contract chains like Solana, Ethereum, and, and stuff like generalized smart contract chains, you actually see that uh, composability is is sort of like a meme, right? That it, it, like the most of smart contract state doesn't actually touch each other, and most things don't need to to, to touch each other. Um, so I think that 
that is bullish for the for, for, for the cosmos thesis that said i think DeFi is like almost all the composability happens on DeFi, and i think that's one of the 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 use cases where you actually do need that synchronicity and that and that composability um and so for us or, or for, for for me or rather speak for myself uh the, the way i see the cosmos thesis play out is um like ibc is is is, is definitely like a big part of that but another big part of that is just having control of your own block space and being able to customize your layer one to suit your own use case, right? Which is if if I'm uh, launching on a generalized smart contract chain, but actually I don't have any benefit from the composability there because I'm like a step in or, or some kind of other application that doesn't like like most applications, NFTs, et cetera, that, that don't really leverage composability, then why not launch on my own chain where I'm not competing with anyone else for block space and I can customize consensus and 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 like different parts of the of the architecture to actually suit my use case and so that, that's the way i see i see that happening and then in terms of DeFi, i do think um and i could be wrong about this obviously but i do think most DeFi activity will happen synchronously in in a single like environment in a single chain um especially like advanced DeFi use cases which for me like the that is sort of one of the biggest uh, killer apps of, of crypto is, is like speculating speculation. Um, and I think uh, that like needs to happen, like to, for that to be to, to be like a, um, enabled in a way that's competitive with a centralized exchange, that needs to happen in, in a synchronous environment. So the way I kind of see it developing is you'll have like many different app chains specialized for their own use cases. And then you'll have a few DeFi focused app chains, which are kind of like the, the city centers um, and assets will be bridged to those chains trustlessly using IBC and the financial speculation stuff will happen there. Whereas like the real uh, activity will happen in the, in, in those app chains. And if you think about it, it's kind of similar to the real world, right? Where you have, like, if you're building a factory, you don't build it in the, and in, in actually producing stuff, you don't do it in the city center. You go, you go to a suburb somewhere or to, or to the outskirts where real estate is cheaper. You're not competing with with like banks and 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 like stores for for, for real estate. And then uh, the, when you when you need to raise money or whatever, you go into the city center, right? And so I think that's that's kind of how, how I see it happening with with Cosmos, where you have Osmosis, um, Injective, Neutron, uh, say, kind of competing to be like these DeFi hubs, these city centers, and then you have a bunch of uh, different like um, app chains that are specialized in their own use cases. You know, and there's already obviously like hundreds of them, but there's there's going to be more and more. And those are uh, sit on sit in the suburbs basically and connect to these DeFi chains via IBC. And so I don't see DeFi apps themselves being built leveraging IBC um, mm. just because of, of how slow it is. Although there will be use cases for it, right? You see with Osmosis, they have their their swap, um, they're like cross chain swap functionality. They, they they call it an outpost, but it's very different from from how like Mars or Astroport see an outpost where with Osmosis, it's like uh, if I'm on Juno, I can swap through Osmosis and all that happens is like, let's say I wanna swap Atom for, for USDC, the Atom is sent to Osmosis by IBC, it's swapped to USDC and then the USDC is sent back to, to, to Juno, right? Uh, whereas with with like uh, Mars, Astroport concept of an outpost, the swap would actually have to have the liquidity would sit on Juno and the swap would happen there so that it can happen fast. And then you can do leverage on top of it and use it as part of collateral and a credit account and this kind of thing. Uh, Mars is, is also like the Mars hub, for example, is also one of those app chains, uh, but it connects to those, you know, kind of marketplaces, city centers, where you think a lot of the, you know, the kind of financial activity is going to happen. Yeah, exactly. I think Mars would want to be present anywhere, like the, as an outpost, it would want to be present anywhere that, that it thinks might have a chance of becoming a, a financial center, right? And, and that will have, and thus will have demand for, for leverage. Um, and then the hub, yeah, it's like a, it's like a suburb where uh, just governance and, and token econ happens and manages all the outposts. Yeah, so one thing I find interesting here, because like, you know, when you've spoken with Sunny, and when, you know, Sunny would describe what's the vision for osmosis, he would actually be like, hey, look, this is also, this should be kind of like a decentralized Binance, you know, and all of the, the functionalities that Binance has, you know, they should be there, like, you know, launchpad, you know, trading, margin, 
in a way described pretty similarly to how you describe Mars, right? But then uh, obviously, you know, it, in a way, osmosis is sort of like covering this spot exchange functionality at the moment and focusing on that. And you guys take like a very different approach in terms of like how to address this. So I think this is very interesting in how you, you kind of have like a similar long-term vision, but like completely different architectures. And at the same time, kind of also like working together now. So it, yeah, it's very fascinating to see that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, I think we have pretty much the, the, the same exact, vision as 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 sunny of the sort of decentralized binance or decentralized ftx which is also why it made a lot of sense to to, to build there um and yeah the, the way i see it is um osmosis is is looking to become the d5 focused chain and so initially it was an amm chain and it was focused on 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 spot but i actually think osmosis's vision is is bigger and the the goal is to become like a d5 focused chain and to then have uh, a bunch of different primitives launch on there to, to fulfill that like Binance like functionality. And so I think like Osmosis is now working on, on concentrated liquidity, which also moves it more away from the AMM, right? Because I think concentrated liquidity is um, like Univ3 style concentrated liquidity is not really an AMM anymore, right? It's more like an order book. It really requires like advanced users to, to be able to, to use that properly. And so I think there will be other protocols that emerge that provide that AMM like functionality that do the, the, the passive kind of liquidity provision. And then Mars will provide like the credit fu functionality that like wraps around all the different use cases. There's perps protocols launching with Levana um, and a bunch of, a bunch of others. So, I mean, I think we have the same vision and, and our view is that like, there's so much to build to make the vision come true that the best thing to do is to partner with like really smart, builders that they can build, they can focus on building different parts of it rather than try and build, build everything yourself. And I think like the opposite approach is something like DYDX, right? Where it's going to be their own app chain. They're also focused on the decentralized finance vision, uh, specifically on like leverage trading and perps, but they're actually trying to build out the whole stack themselves. And they're an awesome team. We're, we're investors. So definitely have, have a lot of uh, respect for them, but it's just like a different approach, right? Um, and it'll be, it'll be interesting to see which one wins out in the end. Yeah, makes sense. Maybe, I guess, to sort of wrap up the talk about um, Mars, can you sort of, you, you mentioned quickly like Mars V2. Can you like sort of talk a little bit about the roadmap for Mars? Where Where is it at right now? Like, you know, what's coming next? Yeah, um, I think the, the next big uh, launch for Mars is, is, is Mars V2, which will be, um, the credit manager, which enables the, the credit account functionality and really like the, the, the most interesting in my view part of Mars, which is that, that like sub account for DeFi functionality. Um, and yeah, I believe like Mars is also looking at launching different outposts, but I think the, the most significant sort of for me is, uh, is that credit account Mars V2 launch. Maybe, maybe one more thing. The, the other, the other side is the, is the perp side, which, um, I think Mars will either end up partnering with, 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 with someone to do, to do perps and kind of looking at a few, a few different teams that are, that are looking to do that or, uh, sort of like building them, um, like, uh, or having some of the contributors build that, build that themselves. Um, cause I think we're, we've been, we're really interested in, in some of the kind of modern perp designs, like the Oracle based perps, because, um, I think especially designs like gains and we actually put it in our list of list of uh, ideas for the accelerator are super interesting because you can get centralized exchange like execution, right? Because you're importing the price from a centralized exchange uh, without actually needing the liquidity, right? Without actually needing like uh, to, to, to bootstrap like a really deep order book or a really deep, deep AMM or something like that. And with something like GANs, you actually only need USDC. So I think a design like that would be super interesting for, for Cosmos uh, because, you know, Cosmos has native USDC, unlike something like GMX, you don't need like ETH and LINK and, and the native assets. And unlike something like DYDX or or uh, or PERP, like an AMM protocol or an order book protocol, you don't need that deep liquidity and market makers and stuff like that. So I think having a protocol like that 
and then integrating with the credit account such that you could use your your liquidity pool shares, your staking, um, whatever else you 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 might have in your credit account as collateral to then trade perps. That's like really the the like an awesome user experience, and I think the vision that that Mars is looking to build towards. So you talked in the beginning uh, a little bit that you know Mars and Astroport are now somewhat uh, independent, and you can go back to the roots of. Uh, incubating and and you you guys also just made an announcement the other day about uh, accelerator. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Like, how, what's it? How does it work? And yeah, what, what has the announcement been about? Yeah, um, yeah. This this was actually the initial vision when we started building. As I said, was that um, we wanted to basically attract our because we, we've always like the, the reason that we started building was we had this uh, we had a lot of views about how things should be built we had like a long list of ideas that we, that, we, that we wanted to build and we didn't have like the and and we we didn't see people doing that so we wanted to kind of like uh, pull up our sleeves and, and, and start start helping to, to make that happen ourselves and the idea with Mars and Astroport was that there would be the initial projects where we, t we take a more active role um, and then that acts as like the proof that, the, of, of what we can do and the value we can add. And then we can we can like scale it out and do more of a Y Combinator style thing. Although we were never going to be um, like more of a Y Combinator style thing in the sense that we work with external teams to help them build out their visions, right? Um, I guess the, the, the difference between what we want to do and what Y Combinator does is rather than uh, Y Combinator is, is, is obviously like more of a spray and pray approach. They do have their request for startup list, but they accept kind of any kind of idea and any kind of space. And then they have this, this, this program. Um, for us, we wanted to go out there with the list of ideas that we think matter. Like we always wanted to, th we, we think about the space a lot. And so we, we, we have like lists of things that we think should exist and then find like really good founders and teams to come and help build out those ideas. Um, and for a lot of those ideas, we already have, designs and, and, and stuff like that. And so, yeah, that, that was kind of the, how, how we saw the accelerator and, and the, the, the sort of the reason we want to do it is just that since like we've been in crypto six years and we've helped, like we've been involved in, in, in investing, uh, consulting and building like multi-billion dollar, super successful protocols. We've seen all the different, uh, we've seen first of all, how hard it is to build a crypto project, right? There's like, a bunch of things that make crypto way harder than, than building a normal startup. There's like the legal side that's super challenging and that everyone spends a lot of money and time on. There's like mechanism design and, and community and how to make these things actually decentralized, which people spend a lot of time on. Um, there's hiring, which is hard because it's like recruiters don't really work. Um, and so we wanted to just kind of take all the lessons that we've learned doing this and, and really transmit them to like a new generation of startups and help build the next kind of generation of, of really important protocols. So, yeah, we thought really hard. We, we spoke to projects that we've worked with and, and also t thought really hard about what would we have wanted to, to, to have as support and what would we have wanted to know when we when we started off in this journey. And that's kind of how we designed the, the accelerator. So the idea is that um, we're going to pick a few teams and like that the hackathon, which we can talk about, is a way that we, we get to know more teams and, and, and get more data on, on, on teams to potentially work with. And then with those teams, we're going to work with them uh, like very intensively for kind of three to six months, although we're obviously work with them forever. And the goal there is just to get them, get them set up, get their legal structure set up, get the protocol design done, um, help them hire, help them set up good operational practices, uh, upsec, everything like that. And then like get them to their first successful fundraising round, help them, help them raise that. Um, and then obviously we'll keep working for, with them from then on, but that's really the goal to take like five, um, or, or more, but for this first cohort, we're focusing on five like early stage projects and really like share everything we've learned about building in the space with them and like help them get to that first milestone of, of a successful uh, fundraise. And can you talk a little bit about, I guess, what sort of ideas are there on your list and maybe also, I guess, ecosystems you're looking at? Is this like specific to, you know, build on Cosmos SDK or are you like more broadly, like whatever substrate chain you're using works yeah so uh for the first first cohort we're going to focus purely on cosmos um we think it's easier for us to add value uh if we focus on one ecosystem that we have deep knowledge of and that we're excited about 
Um, and also like we, we just we have more of a network there and, and stuff like that. But we're, we're for the second cohort and, and like third and stuff, we're, we're definitely going to kind of consider it again and see whether it makes sense to stay on Cosmos or go to an ETHL2 or even something more kind of speculative, like an Anoma or something like that. Um, we're, we're, we'll kind of think through everything from, from first principles there. The approach we, we kind of take to this is just to think about um, from first principles, like five years from now, if crypto is to succeed more broadly and if specifically Cosmos is to succeed um, massively, like what things need to exist uh, for, for, for that to happen? And then how can we have the hackathon and the accelerator be, be um, places where those ideas get, get built kind of thing? Um, and so we think about it in, in, in every sector as kind of, uh, as, as I was saying, sort of like DeFi, metaverse and gaming, um, NFTs, and, and also like identity and, and, and governance. And think about each of those sectors, what needs to exist and what doesn't exist now. And then trying to like spec out some, some solutions for that to get teams thinking about how those, how those could be built. Um, yeah, because I, I think like Ethereum is, is the clear leader right now in terms of uh, like traction, dev activity, liquidity, all of that. But it's still pretty small in the scope of things, right? And so I think every ecosystem is sort of one or two killer apps away from from kind of uh, unseating Ethereum in, in, in my mind. And so um, I think part of it is there's some things that are clearly successful on Ethereum that, that, that other ecosystems need to have, but there's a lot of things that haven't been built yet at all uh, where I think ecosystems can differentiate. And are, are you going to be spending most of your time on the accelerator or on Mars or sort of like split your time or where, where is your personal focus? Yeah. Um, good, good question. So I think for, <laughs> for, for me, yeah, probably split time amongst like Mars and, and Astroport are still really important to labs. They're like the first, they're like our babies. And also I think they need to succeed for, for the accelerator to, to succeed. Like, um, they're, they're the projects that we're more deeply involved in. So really important for us that, that they succeed, but they have like independent teams that are super smart, um, that are, that are thinking about this stuff all the time. So I think we, we take more of like uh, an advisory capacity there. Um, and so uh, I'm mainly focused on, uh, I think my, my main focus is going to be the accelerator moving forward and really like building up a new, and also because the accelerator, especially this first cohort, will actually, if it's successful, um, be really important for, for Mars and Astroport's success too, right? Uh, because it's going to attract a lot of really important projects to, to, to Cosmos, hopefully, and also a lot of projects that um, actually can be potential integrations for, for Mars and Astroport too. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on, Jose. I think we, we covered a lot about like, yeah, Mars, the Delphi story and, and the accelerator. I think, yeah, really excited for what for this to exist in the in the Cosmos ecosystem. And yeah, thanks so much for coming on to Epicenter to, to talk to us. And yeah, see you see you around in, in Lisbon. Yeah, I really appreciate uh, you guys having me and thanks for all the smart questions. Hope it was hope it was useful for people. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Jose.